Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. We are in a school, Central Middle School, and we are at a civic meeting. So I'm going to ask everybody to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you'd remain standing for one minute, we'll have a moment of silence. As we've seen on the news, the tragedy, whether it was in Maui, the 10,000 missing in Libya, the earthquake in Morocco, the flooding in South China, there's a lot happening around the world. A lot of people uh, have been devastated, and also those that are obviously affected by war and famine. If you could just uh, remember those folks. Thank you. Please be seated for those that can. I want to acknowledge uh, some elected officials who are here, and then we're going to introduce the panel. The panel is going to have some remarks, and then we're going to have a question and answer period. And we do have an interpreter, so in the question and answer, we will be, you have to be patient with us uh, as we try to accommodate uh, everybody's needs. So I know we have with us uh, Senator John Keenan, Representative Tacky Chan. Ward 5 City Councilor Chuck Phelan, co-host. City Councilors at Large, Noel DeBona and Nina Liang. Ward 4 Councilor Jim Devine. Members of the School Committee, the Vice Chair Frank Santoro, Barbara Goli, Emily Lebo, Kathy Hubley, and Tina Cahill. Did I miss any electeds? Council at Large, Ian Mahoney is also with us. Okay. So at, at this time, I'm going to introduce, introduce the panel. I'm going to start with the Secretary of Housing and Livable Cities, Secretary Ed Augustus. These, uh, we have two secretaries with us tonight. These are direct appointments of the governor and, and some other folks that are involved in the process. So uh, Secretary, if you could uh, lead off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate you inviting us here tonight, and I appreciate all the folks who are coming out uh, to get some information and. Uh, hopefully we can answer some questions that folks have. Uh, we're going to put up a PowerPoint just to go over a couple of quick items that I think might be helpful for the conversation. Let's go to the next one. So a little background. Massachusetts uh, has what, the, what is called the right to shelter law. This law was put in place 40 years ago in 1983. And the law basically says that if a family, and a family meaning a, a parent uh, and children under the, the age of uh, 21 or a pregnant woman presents themselves to the Commonwealth and is in one of the situations of homelessness, a fire, natural disaster, whatever it may be, that we have an obligation as a Commonwealth to try to find shelter for them. That, I think, not only reflects the law, but I think it also reflects many of our values. Most of us don't want to see children, pregnant women, living on the street uh, in danger. And so we've had this law over the last 40 years, and over various periods of time in that 40 years, we've had spikes in the number of families who've found themselves in the set of circumstances where they needed that emergency shelter. We have permanent shelters around the state, that in more normal times can usually accommodate the needs of families who find themselves in those circumstances. Occasionally, in the course of that 40-year history, we've had periods of time where we've had to use sh motels and hotels uh, and other more temporary sites in order to provide basic shelter for those families. Uh, we are now in a period of unprecedented uh, demand on our shelter system. Uh, as of today, we've got close to 6,400 families who have presented themselves as being homeless, uh, and they are located throughout the Commonwealth, and I'll show you a map that shows kind of the geographic uh, locations of many of our emergency assistance shelters. Uh, you can see here 
uh, the spike in demand, if you look just in January where we were at with about 3,800 families uh, needing the emergency shelter system, uh, and as I just mentioned, as of tonight, uh, September 12th, uh, we have 6,400 families uh, part of that system. So within the period of time from May when the governor put together an incident command structure, uh, which is led by an assistant secretary for, for administration and finance, and he is overseeing a team of staff people from all of the various state agencies that have some role in meeting this crisis. EOPS, public safety, uh, MEMA, the emergency uh, management, health and human services, housing, uh, all of the relevant state agencies working together to try to meet the needs of these uh, families who are seeking emergency shelter. And as you can see, the spike has been significant. And so that has caused us to try to comply with the law, meet the humanitarian needs of the families who are before us, opening shelters at a rate and a pace that is really unprecedented. And as we've done that, we have not always been able to give the communication, the notice that we would ideally like to do in more normal times. If I could predict that every night we would have 20 families, we could logically plan ahead. But some nights we have 50 families, some nights there are 75 families, some nights there are 22 families. And so we are problem solving literally each night depending on who is showing up at one of our um, offices throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or are presenting in emergency rooms in hospitals because it is important that we keep those hospitals open uh, for the health care needs uh, of our residents or at Logan Airport or at other locations that are not ideal locations for families to be uh, living. And if you switch to the next slide, you can see we're in over 80 communities around Massachusetts. So there are 80 communities, and many communities have multiple sites. Uh, my home city of Worcester has multiple sites where we have hotels, we have permanent shelter locations and other facilities that are trying to meet the needs of these families and literally are going from one end of the Commonwealth to the other, uh, including down in the Cape. And every week we are bringing more locations online to meet the uh, needs that we're seeing at our regional offices. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Secretary Walsh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Secretary Walsh uh, is overseeing the welcome centers, which is what you have here in Quincy at Eastern Nazarene, which is a particular strategy that we're using for some of our new arrivals to try to make sure that we understand what their needs are and get them to the appropriate locations after we've identified that. So, Secretary Walsh. Thank, thanks, Ed. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. This is a beautiful school. Uh, middle school's changed a lot since I've been here. Um, so what we tried to do with the Welcome Centers is have a safe and effective way to meet the needs of the families um, as they present to us and to also keep the communities where they end up residing safe. So the Family Welcome Centers do a range of activities. They uh, screen families. They determine if there are any needs. For example, a family um, with a person who's struggling with diabetes, we make sure that we know that so that the uh, so that if they are placed in a hotel, there's a refrigerator there for their insulin. Uh, the public health uh, needs of the uh, of the families are met in terms of childhood immunizations. A, a brief medical screen is done. A brief psychiatric or uh, behavioral health screen is done as well. Many of these families have traveled very long journeys from, um, from you know, and have been traveling literally for years to get to our country. Um, and they've been victims of trauma and, uh, and challenges in their own countries that, that we, can't, we can't imagine, frankly. And so we're trying to make sure that people are cared for, their, you know, their needs are met, that they're registered for the benefits that they are legally eligible for, and that, th that we work with the team that you're going to meet to place them in a hotel where they can be, uh, where they can be safe um, and restart their life here in our country. Uh. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, uh, this is an informational meeting. We want to take questions when we get through the panel, but uh, please be civil and uh, let's make sure everybody can hear. Secretary? Um, on July 31st, we opened the, a welcome center on the campus of Eastern Nazarene, and they've been incredible hosts. Um, over 350 families have gone through that space. They are not residing here in Quincy. They've gone through there, they've had the screening that we talked about that keeps them safe and keeps the, fam the, the communities that they're going to safe, um, and they've connected them to the services that they need. The temporary emergency shelter that is set up for families here in Quincy houses 58 people. So if you assume a family of four, there's you know, fewer than half the people who are in this room are, are here on the campus at, at Eastern Nazarene now. Um, and the families receive wraparound services again, and then they are, they are moved to the uh, shelter space that Ed and his team have found for people all across the state. Um, at this point, I think it's um, really important, if we can go to the next slide, for you, for you to meet the people who are doing the work on the shelters and to hear a little bit about their, their journeys and hear about these families that, that Eastern Nazarene is hosting. So it's my, um, my honor to introduce uh, Bill McCoy from Eastern Nazar Nazarene. Thank you, Secretary Walsh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as the Secretary said, my name is Bill McCoy. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs at ENC, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you all uh, a little bit about uh, ENC's role uh, in this program. I, uh, before I say just a few things, I'll just uh, point to that web address at the bottom of the slide on the screen uh, there for you, enc.edu slash FAQ. This is a page that we've set up that tries to address uh, the most commonly asked questions that we've been uh, receiving, and so we hope that that will be a, a beneficial resource uh, to all of you as you're uh, trying better to understand uh, what's happening uh, on our campus. Uh, I'm going to speak just briefly uh, to one of the questions that I, I know has been asked in a number of different uh, ways in different contexts, which is, how did ENC uh, come to be involved in this project? Why is ENC doing this? Please, please, folks, please. So, folks. If I may, uh, certainly we, we arrived in this conversation uh, because we, were, we had some space on our campus that was underutilized, uh, and we needed to find a way. Uh, we've been working uh, for the past two years, uh, as many institutions of higher education have been doing, to try to deploy those resources in creative ways that would sustain the mission of the college. Uh, the So we uh, had been looking for a variety of opportunities and had engaged a number of, of smaller endeavors. Uh, some of you may be aware, for example, uh, that ENC opened up dorm space for Quincy College students uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and a number of them have been living on our campus uh, while participating in Quincy College's nursing program and, and some of their uh, other academic areas. Uh, so it was because we were out and looking for opportunities uh, to leverage those underutilized spaces that we did learn uh, about this particular need uh, over the summer. Uh, and it was that that led us to engage. Uh, the reason, of course, uh, the thing about this that was particularly appealing was not just that it would utilize space and help underwrite our mission, absolutely, uh, but that it, we, in our view, aligns exceedingly well with our mission in educating students uh, and our historic identity uh, as an institution of the Church of the Nazarene, uh, a, a tradition that is proudly rooted in care for people in need uh, and operates hundreds of compassionate ministry centers uh, around the world. 
And so we see this work as being very much consistent with that tradition, as well as presenting a really unique opportunity uh, for our students to be formed and to have uh, exposure and deep conversations about issues that are clearly pressing. You don't, I mean, the interest in this meeting alone is all that you need to know, uh, need to see to understand that questions about immigration and housing are enormously important ones in the world we live in today. And we're glad to have the opportunity to help our students understand that uh, in, in deeper and truly unique ways. As I said, we don't provide many of the services that are associated uh, with this operation. We are really the space uh, that makes this possible. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over now to the two agencies that are primarily involved in the service operations, Bay State Community Services and AMI. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, um, and thank you for being here. My name is Jerice Cox, and I'm the Executive Director at Bay State Community Services. We're a local nonprofit agency that's providing over 50 years of service, of social services, behavioral health services to the greater South Shore area. Our, our focus has always been on children and families. Um, we became involved through our Quincy Family Resource Center. So the state has set up a phenomenal system to really wrap around and provide supports. Therese, can you get closer to the mic? Sorry. Thank you. That better? Okay. Do you want me to start again or just from the last thing I did? Okay, thank you. Um, so the state set up the Quincy, uh, the Family Resource Center, which is a, a, an amazing service for all families um, throughout the Commonwealth. We have the Quincy one. We've served thousands of families, local families, maybe your families that have been in this room, providing those supports. When this crisis happened, um, we came together and said, how do we make sure that we can continue to support the families in our communities as well as these newly arriving families? So really what we've done is looked at how we make sure that we are providing services to everybody. So the folks that are coming in are getting basic needs. In, in both locations, but generally what happens is folks are coming in, they're getting basic needs, diapers, wipes, formula, strollers, blankets, hygiene product, products. We then, as Secretary said, we do an assessment, really trying to understand where the family is at and how we can support them. We do basic needs assessment. We also look to see if there's family, why they're here, how the, we can help them, integrate into their different families that the reason that they came here, if that's available. Um, when the families arrive, they're generally arriving from the hospital, the airport. We see babies that have been sitting on um, the airport floor back and forth night to night, families that are exhausted. So they're coming in and really what we're trying to do is do that quick needs assessment, see what we can do, and provide whatever supports we can do for them. We make sure that they qualify for the Family Welcome Center and the Eastern Nazarene program. They have to be families and they have to be with children. I know that's been a concern for folks, um, or pregnant. We, we have DTA. We also have DTA that's in the system, as well as WIC, so that we're really able to wrap around folks to provide that, those supports. They're generally with us in the Family Welcome Center for a couple of hours. We're doing this assessment and we're moving most of the families along. As the Secretary said, most of these families are not staying at ENC. They're moving to other hotels throughout the Commonwealth, um, as was indicated. The ones that stay at ENC um, are provided support with AMI. So I'm gonna hand it over to our partners in AMI. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is uh, Patrick Dennis. I'm the program director uh, for uh, the uh, temporary emergency shelter. So a little bit about AMI. AMI is an expeditionary uh, healthcare uh, company uh, that provides structure and uh, systematic solutions. Uh, in, in context of our work here, we're providing and managing and operating all of the necessary pieces for the shelter that requires the day-to-day uh, -day operations from feeding all the way through uh, taking care of the transportation and everything else of the families and the guests that they're there. 
Um, I think the important thing to understand is that uh, it's 24 hours, seven days a week. And the important thing is, is that these families are coming, as you've heard before, coming from very far and long uh, ways to come here. And the important thing is that we, ENC, Bay State, AMI, we have created a triad where we are all working together hand in hand. And our goal and what we strive for every day is to have a center of excellence. A, this actually does work very, very well. Our families are uh, taken in once Bay State has identified them, once we have a uh, vacancy. And once that is, we take the families in we get them processed in, they go through a cultural orientation, and they also go through house rules. After that, they are then come back the next morning to meet with their case manager. That case manager begins the process of getting their benefits. Once they have received their benefits, which is with usually within five to seven working days, then they are then uh, we work with Secretary Augustus's team to get a referral and get them processed and placed at a different location. And that is the process that goes through every day. And it's a very uh, calm and uh, peaceful process without any issues or um, any um, hiccups. Sure. I just want to make sure that some of the key things that, like I just described to you all, is that we are doing the day-to-day -day operations, taking care of the family so they can move through, and then also we're doing uh, extensive case management to get there, doing there. We haven't opened it up for questions yet. If you yes. kindly let the panelists finish, and then we'll open it up for questions, please. I, I'm done with uh, my... Uh, presentation well thank you very much okay here's what we're going to do we have a microphone at the front of each aisle it would ask people to orderly come to the microphone don't wait for somebody you could line up now I'm going to alternate between both sides of the room if there's a lot of people in the room I'd ask you to please be brief ask the question we're going to get it answered and interpreted at the same time and I'd ask you to please be respectful so we're going to start on that side what are the benefits? Who's paying for them? We've got tons of veterans that need the same services that aren't getting them. These people are riding a, getting a free ride. Um, thank you, sir, for that question. I, I can appreciate, like many of, I think everyone in this room, I share our the respect and commitment to the people who served our country. And um, I think the challenge that um, veterans experience, particularly the mental health challenges they face that often leads to homelessness, is exactly what our agencies are designed to try to solve. The, the benefits that, that people are, the people who come to our shelters are legal, legally allowed in the country. They are not illegal. They have been granted. They have been granted something called parolee status at the border. Okay. What? At the border by the federal government of our country. Folks, please, please. And in, in Massachusetts, they are eligible for food through the SNAP program, which is a federal program. Medical care through the Mass Health program, and in some cases, transitional assistance. Most, the, two pro, the last two programs that I, one is a federal program, SNAP, I'm trying to answer your question very specifically. Medicaid is a state and federal share, kind of a 50-50 split, and DTA is a Massachusetts program. And my team can tell me if there's some federal support, but I don't know. 
So that's how, how people are paid for, and they are legally in our country and entitled to these benefits. We're gonna, um, um, please, folks, uh, we're going to alternate. going to go this way. If you could just give your name and address, because I want to make sure we're serving the Quincy community here. So please. Hello. Hello. Yeah, okay. Uh, David Carter, 185 Hamilton Ave, lifetime Quincy resident. Never seen things look worse, but we have enough homeless people in Quincy as it is. And I want to know how much, how much is the Nazarene being compensated per family? It's got to be a dollar amount. What is it? The other, the other, I'm talking to you on the suit. How much are you getting? It's not, it's not, it's not that complicated. I'm, how much? So Eastern Nazarene is, is not being compensated per family. They're not. It's a lease. They're total package then. What? And then, ambulance, you guys should pay for. Shouldn't come out of my tax money. I don't want them here. I never did. I didn't get a vote. Bring them to Maura Healy. Uh, tell, tell Maura Healy to bring them to her house. <laughs> yeah, she's got a suite. Tell her to bring them to her house. We're gonna go to the. We're gonna go to the. All right, Mr. Carter, you've made a point. I'm gonna go to the other side of the room. Can you go to the microphone, please? Over the side. Yeah, I'm a resident at Newport Ave. And uh, I'm also an American citizen. Okay. Okay. I want to ask you to the gentleman. Bring a family to his home. A question for the gentleman in the right tie. Have you ever brought a family, a refugee family, to your own home? I haven't brought one to my home, but I have brought them to my city. Okay. We're, we're going to go to the other side. One question per person. We're not going to have a debate at the microphone. We have a lot of people in the room here. We're going to go to the other side, please. I just wanted to say a quick, quick message of unity. I absolutely agree there shouldn't be a single homeless veteran in Quincy. There shouldn't be homeless people anywhere in the United States. But it's not the immigrants that are causing that problem. It's the people making billions of dollars off of us paying $2,000 a month every month. It's the people making billions of dollars off of our health care costs that have gone sky high in recent decades. They're the ones causing the problem. That's the same group of people who's causing the problems in Haiti, in Central America, causing horrific violence in those nations, which leads to those people coming here looking for a place. So let's not pit ourselves against those people. Let's pit ourselves against the people causing the problems. My Paracy, Quincy, Mass, 14, it's none of your business what street I live on. Hi, Joe Heresy, Quincy. Back to this side. William Doyle, Beach Street, Quincy. Um, I would like everybody to pay, pay close attention to what I'm going to say. What he said was correct on the right to shelter is correct. It's a law that's been on the books for a long time. But what he refused to tell you is that they can make an amendment on this law. 
and, and the governor and the legis legislature can change this very quickly. We as a room here, if we want to fight, we have to call the legislature, call the governor, and tell them to ma amend this law. Why? Because we cannot sustain this many people in our state. We cannot pay for this. We cannot school this many people. This has to be a law that can be amended by the governor, the legislature. Everyone here has to start calling the governor, calling the legislature, tell them to amend this law. Otherwise, we're going to kick you out of office. Thank you. Going to go to the other side. James Ikeda, uh, I am a history teacher at Quincy High. I now live in Norwood because I couldn't afford to buy a house here. <laughs> but I used to live here for 10 years. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for doing important work under difficult circumstances. And, um, and then I'm of the very controversial opinion that I think all, all people deserve to have a home. And I'm not in the business of hierarchizing who is more or less important on any basis whatsoever. So thank you very much for doing the work that you're doing. And for those of you who are very angry about uh, immigration policy or the rest of it, uh, as a historian, you may want to do a little bit of research on the history of American immigration, which I can help you out with. Immigration Act of 1924. Okay. You already had a question. Uh, the next person would be up, please. Hi, David Shiga. I live on Rawson Road, just down the street from ENC. Um, I wanted to ask the panel about, um, well, just the context for my question is that so many of us either came to this country ourselves from another country, or our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, and came here with nothing but a strong spirit and a willingness to work hard and a desire to make something of themselves and a better life, life for their children. And I am betting that it's true of these immigrants as well. And I would like to know if you could tell us something about the successes you've seen of people who have come through the shelter system and been able to thrive and contribute to the state of Massachusetts. We're working very hard to connect the people who are in shelter to work. You know, people know have limited English. Many people speak, speak multiple languages because they, they've been in multiple countries on their way to this journey. But the one word they say to all of us is work. We want to work. Help us find work. And so we are working very hard to uh, try to speed up a very cumbersome process for work authorizations. Um, the governor's reached out to the federal government. We have um, our Office of Immigration and Refugee Services has been doing this work for a long time, it just hasn't been very public to connect people with the work authorizations they need so they can, so they can support their families and contribute to our economy. You know, as the Secretary of Health and Human Services, 30% of the human services jobs across our state are vacant right now. These are people who care for frail elders. These are people who care for severely disabled kids. And we're, we're very anxious and hopeful that we can connect this willing and able workforce with, with Massachusetts residents who need these services. I, I appreciate the question, and I think if we all just took a breath and thought for a minute about how much these folks are similar to us. And the reason I, the reason I say that is because I'm assuming many folks in this room are parents or grandparents. And if you were in a situation where there was literally no police, no military, violence, threats against your children, you would grab your children and you would run to safety. And you would hope to God that there was somebody there to accept you. That's what these folks are doing. They're no different at a fundamental level than everybody in this room. So we can certainly talk about the processes with which we try to manage this crisis. 
but I think it is so important that we do not dehumanize these individuals. This side of the room. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lily, and I'm from Belmont Street and Carruth Street in Quincy. And I wanted to thank you all for your hard work. I'm sure it takes a lot of heart and capacity and time and working in the middle of the night um, to answer these calls. Um, and my question is, as a child of immigrants, I know how hard people work to live and sustain their lives in this country and feel like they're part of our community. And I want to ask, like, how can we as neighbors support our new community members um, in any way possible? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that you know, anything we can do to be welcoming and supportive, a smile goes a long way for scared children. Um, so I think that's a, a really critical piece. We need diapers, we need wipes, we need baby formulas. I mean, they, they, these, are, they, these are resources that they don't, they don't have. So anything like that would be very helpful. Thank you, my name is uh, Alan. I live on uh, Ridgeway Street in Wollaston. I'll, I'll do what I want to do, sir. Why don't you let me ask my question? So, first of all, thank you for these informative slides. I found this meeting very helpful in understanding what's going on. And I think this question is really directed towards the NC. I've noticed in the neighborhood when I talk to people, there's been an information vacuum. Minimal information has been provided, and that gets filled with fear and rumor. So I would like to understand why ENC didn't do more communication earlier in the process so that people would be informed and be able to understand better what's going on. And I'd also, just building on the last comment, if people do want to make donations of diapers and such, where and how would they do that? Thank you. Uh, sure, I can, I can speak to that question. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, the, there's a, a few different points. I, as Secretary Walsh, I believe it was earlier mentioned, uh, the speed at which these things are developing uh, is pretty unprecedented uh, and uh, definitely contributed to the problem that you are highlighting. Uh, as we were moving through the, uh, moving through the process of finalizing the licensing agreement, uh, we had the clear understanding that uh, there was a, um, you know, we were responsible for communication to our internal constituencies, to our students and their families, to our alumni, uh, et cetera, and that the state was handling external constituencies. And I'll freely admit, we didn't ask enough questions about exactly what was going to be involved in those communications to external constituencies. When we realized that there was a, a gap in what we would have liked to have seen people know, we did what we could. Uh, we don't have a giant marketing uh, uh, office to, to fund a, a huge uh, marketing campaign. Uh, so I did, a, I did an interview on Quincy Access TV within days of its opening. Uh, I personally called many of you. I, well, I don't know if you're here in the room, but I called every neighbor who reached out to the college and asked for uh, an explanation of what we were doing. Uh, we did publish immediately uh, a story on our website and uh, an earlier version of the FAQ page that I referenced earlier, which we have subsequently tried to keep up to date and are, are going to try to continue to do that. So I, I won't, uh, yeah, I won't sugarcoat it. It, it wasn't enough, um, but that wasn't, um, yeah, I guess that's all I can say about that. Um, uh, Doris, do you want to say something about the uh, donations? And yeah, thank you. Um, there's a couple of ways to go on. Um, we, um, there's 85 Quincy Avenue Way Recovery Center. We'll take any diapers, donations. You can go on our website, baystatecommunityservices.org, and there's a drop down if you'd like to make a donation specifically for the Family Welcome Center. Rice Road. And I'd like to ask Easton Nazarene, I'm here for my neighborhood, first of all. I'm not here for the people, I'm happy for the people. I'm glad they're here, I'm glad they're, they have a better life now. I'm here for, for my neighborhood, because my, this is a change 
for our neighborhood. And a lot of people are here because of that reason. There's a big change going on. We don't even know if all these kids with them, supposedly maybe 58 of them, are gonna flood Eastern um, Beachwood Nola School. Has anybody answered that question to the public? Where are you gonna, where are you gonna teach all these kids? And, but my main question is this. Now that Eastern Nazarene is happy with all the money that they're getting from the state, and I understand it. I understand a lot of people here are unhappy because it was backdoored to us. There was nobody knew nothing. It was just boom. It's there, and but it's going to be there. It's going to stay there. There's nothing we can do about it. But the main question is, how long is it going to be there, and who is going to be there after the Haitians? I can, um, I can, okay. the, temporary, the, temporary welcome, the temporary welcome centers are temporary. Um, they are how long? three to five days. People are there. Families are there. And, 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 and the families that are there, because they are there for a short time, Madam Secretary, I think the question is how long of the contract between the state and ENC? It's a year, but they intend on keeping the people there for 20 years. I, I think your question's legitimate. Look, let's let them ask it. Answer the question. Yeah, Mr. Burke, whoa, uh, the licensing agreement is, uh, has a scheduled duration of one year. We don't know the answer to that. On, I'm sorry, we it, don't know the answer to all that All right, question. thank you. Yeah. Can I go to this side of the room? Hello, everyone. My name is Tui, and I live on Huntley Road, and I'm also a business owner in Quincy. Um, I want to share a story because um, I was a refugee. Um, I was on a boat for eight days, I mean, 10 days and 10 nights in the Pacific Ocean. And I was accepted to come to the U.S. and I was placed in, in, a, in a family. Um, I, was, I grew up as the foster kid in a foster care program. And I wanna thank the United States and all the people that helped me along the way um, to become who I am today. I'm a contribute, I would like to say that I'm a contributing citizen. Um, I went to two colleges, <laughs> I pay my tax. I follow the rules and the laws, and I give back. Um, so as a refugees, and if I can put myself in the state of mind of the refugees that are coming here, they're running for their lives. The only thing they worry about is basic needs, food, shelter, and safety. They're not gonna go and hunt down your kids or take over whatever that you're fearful about. And since this is only a one year, this is a transition time. I was in a refugee camp for four months, and that was the processing time before I was placed in the U.S. Um, so having lived in this country and being taken care of by all Americans in the country here, and I would like to give back. And I understand that the Bay State is doing something I was wondering if the mayor, um, if the city of Quincy is doing something, um, fundraising, some kind of. When I was eight years old in the refugee camp, all I wanted was a teddy bear. So I would imagine a lot of your children would love to give and share that teddy bear to one of the kids that's staying at ENC. Maybe we can do a teddy bear drive what do you think? Um, that's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> Going to go the other side. Hi, uh, Teresa Squanum. Actually, the woman over there, you know, she definitely is the kind of refugee, the kind of person that comes to this country and wants to work, just like my grandparents did. There's like probably all these other people did. The problem is, is are we going to have that same thing now? And my question was actually the gentleman's question, how long, how long? Because you can only sustain it so long. We can only can have an influx of people a bit at a time so that we can then let them assimilate 
as Americans, because that's what we all have to do. We have to assimilate. We're not looking to bar anybody from coming here, but you have to do it the right way. And if you bash in my back door, then I get upset. And that's my big concern, because as a, ta as a taxpayer, you're bashing in my door and taking away the kind of money I'm trying to put into the city for my own kids, for my own family. And for the people with the red hearts, are they taking in people themselves because they're so generous? And again, we're a generous country. So I guess my big question, again, was, you stole my thunder before me. <laughs> I was just wondering how long. And is there an end in sight? And if there isn't, what are we going to do? Are you going to talk to your people in Congress and maybe think about doing something at the border? Because a lot of these people were living in South America a perfectly good life. But they knew the doors were open, and they came to the border, and now we're where we are, everywhere in the country. I have no problem with immigration. None of us in this, in this room do. None of us do. It's all about legality, and it's not right that people are cutting the line. So my question is to you, how much, how much does Quincy have to give, you know, how much? So I've got the numbers wrong, has 58 families. Which is how many people? Figure an average family of four. And, and again, will they be coming into the school system? Right now, they are, they are at the temporary shelter for three to five days. They are, there may be a family that we can't place that will end up in the Quincy schools, but you are not a full-time shelter. All right, and my last question unlike, is- Unlike many other cities in com, across the Commonwealth, so many other cities have absorbed lots more kids. I, well, I'm, I'm aware of that, and that's a shame that this whole country is dealing with that. But the big question is, is how much longer, how much longer? Okay. We'd like to, uh, like to keep it moving. I think the question's been addressed. Uh, if we can go back to this side of the room. Hi there. My name is Anne. I live on North Central Avenue in Quincy. Uh, I beg your pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, he was discussing my uh, clothing. I'm fascinated. So uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your work. Um, whether most people in this room remember, I do not think there's one person here who is more than two or three generations away from an unwanted, suffering, frightened refugee immigrant themselves. It's the least we can do. We are all here free to say what we want and go home in safety because our own people were allowed in, often unwanted and suffering terribly. It is an honor that Quincy can continue its historic place as a gateway city. Yes, we all know about the Adams family and they're lovely, but the truth is this has been a city of immigrants and opportunity for immigrants, which is why it's a good city, which is why it will be a great city. This is nothing new. We have done this forever, but for once, people are getting a little helping hand. Thank you. I'm Melissa Shapiro. I live on Raleigh Street in Quincy Center. Um, I work at one of the hospitals in Boston that has also been dealing with the influx of migrants and refugees um, to the point to where we were, we were, these are the folks that we are seeing sit, um, sitting with their families in our hospital because they have nowhere else to go while they're accessing medical care well, uh, and just didn't, they're just sitting there until there was somewhere else to there go. So I want to thank you for bringing in this temporary shelter. Um, happy to have that here in Quincy. And I'd like to ask, are there are medical services provided on campus or are these where there's transported to other locations? Oh, you want to do that? Go. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for your question. So uh, with the families, they are uh, provided a uh, health screening and based on that health screening, uh, 
we then provide uh, with the nurses provide uh, public health information and whatnot. However, if there is a medical intervention, then they are uh, then transported to uh, Manit Community Hospital or uh, to uh, BMC. Thank you. The site. Hi, my name is Jenny McGrail. I live on Sachem Street. Um, I grew up on Sachem Street and I live across the street from m many administrators at EMC. Um, and I just, I know this has kind of already been addressed, but I just have to say I'm, I'm absolutely nothing against the work that you guys are doing. I think that um, I get that you're doing something good, but I'm really disappointed in EMC in their lack of communication with uh, your neighbors, like we're your neighbors. And I just think that this would be, um, I think this would actually have turned out a little bit different if you had sent a letter. I understand that you don't have a huge marketing department, but a letter to your neighbors saying, this is what we're doing. And I'm just disappointed. Um, and I have one other question for Mayor Koch. Um, I wasn't at all worried about safety. Um, you know, I, I see these families walking up and down my street. They're lovely, I smile and wave. Clearly, I'm not worried about my safety until Saturday night. Um, and now I'm worried about my kids' safety and I'm wondering if you're gonna like have a patrol or something because there are people far right, far left who are have these drastic opinions and now I'm worried that you know my daughter is gonna walk over to her friend's house and and come in contact to someone with someone who's there to protest or to you know I, I, I certainly can address that um, a couple of things one is I because it was a question earlier there have been no children enrolled in our schools so the impact when we when we heard about this the questions I had what kind of impact would it have uh, emergency services, uh, schools, whatever it may be. Uh, so there's been no impact on our schools. Uh, our police department uh, is an excellent police department. They're well staffed. We actually have the highest number of patrol officers in more than 40 years. So the, the neighborhoods are well staffed. What happened the other night was a bunch of outside ignorant um, fools, quite frankly. And we, we s the police were monitoring it closely. Uh, people have constitutional rights, and the police were prepared if they crossed the line, they, they would have all been locked up. So things are being monitored very closely. We have a safe city, and we're going to continue to have a safe city. I can assure you the resources are available. Go to the side. Good evening, Mr. Thank you, and thank you, panel, for the work you're doing, and for those of us who are coming out tonight to share as neighbors. My name is Tess Brown, Marie Therese Brown, or Sister Marie Therese Brown. I'm a sister of Charity of Nazareth. There are other sisters and other people of faith in our group here tonight. Many of us, I think, are all people of faith of some, or people of goodwill. And I appreciate the ones who have shared no matter whether I agree, but I just think it's good that it can come out as neighbors. I have been a resident for about 30 years of, in Quincy. As I said, I'm a Catholic sister, a woman of faith, an immigrant, a US citizen, and I vote. I have paid taxes during my years because I worked with nonprofits. I did not, uh, many times when I worked for the church, as you know, we don't get paid much. But I, the other places where I paid, and I was, I paid my taxes. And I'm an immigrant, as I said. I had to come up here because 60 years ago today, on September the 12th, I landed from Trinidad and Tobago at Idlewild Airport. I wanted to meet President John Kennedy, and I wanted to meet Martin Luther King. I had a full scholarship to become a doctor, I thought. I was gonna study pre-med with the Franciscan sisters who have Cardinal Cushing School. Instead, God had other plans. And when I ended up in Milwaukee, I could not go home for four years on my scholarship. But the women in my class who didn't look like me, who came from different places, made sure myself and the other foreign students always had a home. 
And even when I was flying on September 12, 1963 to Milwaukee on a Northwest airline, a gentleman next to me, Mr. Singer from Wisconsin, asked me if I ever had apple pie with cheese. I thought, cheese? But I was going to Wisconsin. <laughs> so he invited me home, and myself and another student went and had dinner with him. I was welcome. I didn't come on a boat. I wasn't stranded. My mother scraped it together as a single prayer and that I could fly. And I'm glad that we are welcoming one another here. And finally, because many of us who may be Catholic in this room on Sunday, in Romans we heard, love does no evil to the neighbor. Love fulfills the law. And no matter how hard it is, as others have reminded us, the history we have in this country and in this city, and many of you may have gone to St. Anne's School. Sisters of Charity of Nazareth taught in this space and also taught at Archie's. And so I think God is asking us to maybe open our hearts, stretch our tents a little more. It's tough. We didn't get enough notice, but now we are doing it. So let's try and work together. Welcome, folks, and let's get moving. Thank you. I'm uh, Patrick from Quincy, uh, Franklin Street in Quincy. I uh, just want to say that you know, Bay State Community Services helped save my daughter's life. And there's nobody in this room that can't find themselves in the position of needing the services that these people help maintain and uh, supply to us. We should all be very thankful that we live in a place that we have services like this for everybody for the person that just arrived to the person that's lived in Quincy for 98 years or in Massachusetts for 98 years. Now, Jesus Christ is Lord, and he commands us to love our neighbors more than we love ourselves. So we need more of that because you very well could find yourself look, looking for a room at ENC. It could be you tomorrow. So just be grateful that you live in a nation that people want to come to, and you're going to have to deal with that burden. And you should, be, you should feel blessed to deal with that burden. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Angela Cristiani. I am a resident of Quincy. And I actually, my esteemed colleague Lily asked the question I was going to ask. Um, by license, I'm a licensed educational psychologist. I'm a school psychologist. And I've worn many hats in my career, including the political one. Um, First of all, I want to thank you for coming, and I know your work is not easy, and I want to thank the mayor, and I want to thank the police and the elected officials who are here. It's important. And um, I'm presuming the children and the families in the screening, it's the mental health, somebody mentioned mental health, and when they transfer, they're getting, I'm sure there's trauma, and they, their needs are being met. The answer is yes, okay. Um, I stand up in front of you, I lived my whole life in Quincy, and I've been very blessed. My father, who's passed three years ago, would have said, get up, get up. And my father um, founded the school psychology program at UMass Boston. He was born to an immigrant woman who was illiterate on a kitchen floor in Roxbury. And my father never told people. And he didn't speak English when he started school in the Boston Public Schools. And the program that exists today was intended to represent the children and the families because he was a minority in his day. and. Um, it was because of this country, and it's, it, it, I knew my great-grandparents, and they were, they were laborers. And if it was, wasn't for America, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I'm just hoping that people can find some unity and um, work together. Again, I thank the mayor, and I thank, uh, sister, I have to tell you, I, I'm a Fontbon girl. <laughs> Sisters of St. Joseph, so you all have a special spot in my heart. We, my parents used to say, same skipper at the helm, different poets of call. <laughs> Thank you. Again. And, uh, <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音> 造成今天非法移民,难民满街都是的状况,是我们这些普通老百姓造成今天的状况吗? 好,稍微等一下,谢谢。
so I heard a lot of people are saying that uh, we are against immigrants. Uh, we just don't uh, have the passion for the newcomers. But my question to all of you who said that, so who caused the problem of the new immigrants, of the refugees? I don't think we caused the problem. Uh, no, 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 sleepy joke, okay. Yeah. So it's not us who are the common people who cause the, uh, the, the refugees or the new immigrants to flood the streets. We welcome all the new immigrants. 但是在法律里面申请兄弟姊妹、家庭移民、寄宿移民，通过法律渠道是要等待漫长的时间，十年、十五年、二十年。呃，but uh, uh, you know, if you apply your siblings uh, based on the immigration law, or if you apply for the green card based on your talent, uh, generally it would take you uh, about 10 to 15 years to get the approval. But those uh, illegal immigrants can get the status overnight. Uh, I think the border, uh, the ice at the border, it's just uh, uh, not really real. Uh,抱歉,抱歉,你有问题要问吗?抱歉。No,你们不去指责政府官员的无能。但是, uh, so you don't uh, put the question to the, the government official, officials, but you, you just accuse us. Yeah, you are idiots and you are just shameless. Okay, my name is Anne Ford, and I live on Sachem Street. Um, I do want to uh, reiterate what the other person that lives on Sachem Street did. We were very disappointed. I'm also a graduate of Eastern Nazarene College, and we were very disappointed about the way they handled everything. But I'm also here tonight on behalf of a friend of mine who was displaced from Eastern Nazarene College, living in an apartment because of the immigrants. I... <laughs> I actually, let me, let me finish. I have, and they were not just, the, she was not the, the only one. I have um, two emails from another two um, residents that were, got 30 days notice to leave their apartment, and they had to quit their jobs, pack up their bags, and go back to California because they couldn't find residential area, they couldn't get rentals in this area. This was not, I, you know, you're, you're, you're placing someone, you're recognized as a nice uh, college and you're doing Christian work, but this is not Christian when you throw out hardworking taxpayers that are paying for rentals. And I am very, like my friend was so upset tonight that she couldn't come. So I came here to speak on her behalf. So, quiet, please, please let the uh, gentleman answer the question. Yeah, the, the two instances that you are describing are difficult and sad situations. There's no question about it. It is, it is a misperception that it was tied. It, they were given notice 30 days. on those apartments, and it was 30 days notice mm -hmm. prior to our entering into the agreement or before it had even gained serious no, traction. No, no, that's not true. You the, told you told them that they were going, they had to go because they had it, it was they were being replaced by faculty the, until they found out on the news why they were being displaced. The no, the apartments that they occupied 
are now housing employees of Eastern Nazarene College. We had made that decision earlier. But and you couldn't take care of your own before you took care of the immigrants. Don't get me wrong, I have no problem with that, but these people are hard-working taxpayers. And you, you, you actually, they actually had to give up their jobs. So what are you telling me that, oh, you know, you, you're doing one, you're, with the right hand you're doing good, and with the other hand you're, do, you're sending them away? That's not right. That is not right. I, so, I mean, it has to be known. And I mean, as I said, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a graduate myself of Eastern Nazarene College. I was very proud of Eastern Nazarene College until this came up. My friend was displaced. She got 30 days. She had to get a loan from a bank to get help and get help to get money. Whereas you're helping everybody else, but you're not helping your own. This is a problem. Thank you, ma'am. Hello everyone, I live in Quincy for 25 years. After, I love Quincy. I never left the city. I've been staying here since I arrived to this country. Did you ever ask the opinion of our Quincy resident before you set up this shelter? Why not? Why not ask us first? Is it because they will support Democrats and they will give you votes and you will rather sacrifice? if you want to talk about democracy and election, let's vote by one person, one vote in Quincy, by Quincy resident, and let's vote on it. Do you dare? I do. Let's vote on it. One resident, one vote. Let's vote on it. And if we all agree, then I admit that. But let's vote on it. Sorry, So if we vote and then we don't agree, so please get out. No, no, ask those people, bring them home, bring to their bed, yeah. I just say that, I just say that. Sit down. Gotta go this side of the room. Is he done now? My name is Veronica Bertrand and I live on Copeland Street in Quincy. Um, I was raised on Rogers Street in West Quincy, and just recently my parents, the house we grew up in, was sold after 75 years of my parents when they bought it. They raised 13 children here. And I think my parents would be like rolling in their graves if they saw the hate in this room for immigrants because my entire family is here because of immigrants from France, Canada, Italy, and I have nieces and nephews who are born of immigrants. And all I can say is, I, I really wanted to say something profound, but I actually had to go to the Bible in Matthew 25, verse 35 to 40. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous said, Lord, when did we see you hungry? 
When did we feed you, or thirsty, or give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer to them, assuredly I say to you, for as much as you did to one of the least of my brethren, you did to me. My name is Holly. I've been a resident of Massachusetts all my life, but most importantly, I'm an American. Anyway, my husband served 18 years in the Navy. He answered the most noble call that most people who join the military have done. So I thank everybody for their service. My husband and I had a talk the other night, and he's really upset about the state of this country and what's been going on, and we're being put last. Whatever happened to America first? My mother and father-in-law fled communist China. They came here, they went through the system, they got a green card, a visa, and years later they got their citizenship. They came in the front door. Let's all do that. I am not against immigration at all. We're all immigrants, but do it the right way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sue Darty. I live on C Street. Uh, I've been living in Quincy since 1999. And I, I just want to talk just briefly about uh, refugees, the sense that my family um, is descended from refugees from Ireland. When I went there a couple uh, years ago, everywhere I went, I saw statues of the hunger. And we know that's why a lot of us are here. Um, so that's my refugee story. Um, the other story is that when I, I lived in Atlanta for a while, I'm a teacher and educator, I, I decided to, I've worked with a lot of kids who are refugees too and I do understand there's a process and that these people are here legally and they're, most people aren't going to leave their country just for fun, um, especially the way, if you can stay, if you're in a country where things are great and you have a nice home, why would you leave? Um, unfortunately, we're pricing out everybody of housing in this country, really, and that's a different separate issue, and I think that's partly what's underlying the problem that people are feeling really upset about is, is lack of housing, lack of affordable housing in the city, but I'm kind of going off track. So I volunteered for a refugee um, organization when I was living in Atlanta, and I worked with this family from Bosnia, and um, I used to go over to their house and like just, just to kind of help orient them to, um, to the United States. They had an apartment, and it was in a really rough part of Atlanta. Um, they, you know, they were hearing gunshots all the time. They weren't living l l the life of luxury. My point is that um, they were working so hard, they would just really want, the guy had, the, the father had bought a little 18-wheel um, toy truck, and he had it on his, um, he had it on his, uh, mantle in the, um, in the apartment because he wanted to be a truck driver and he, they, want, they wanted to work. So, and then I found out with students as well, a lot of the students, I will say, I, I hate to say it, but sometimes the refugee or the immigrant parents were much better to me as a teacher than some of the Americans were. I'm being honest about that. So they were more respectful. Um, not all American parents, but just kind of putting that out there. I, I don't know what people are yelling about, but I just want to thank you. Um, we're going to be looking for opportunities to volunteer, help, donate, and just um, thank you for, your, for what you're doing. And I know that most of the, I think most of the people in this room are on the more of the side of love than hate. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Stice. I live on Winthrop Avenue in Quincy. I've been a Quincy resident for over 40 years. I was a Quincy Public Schools parent for 16 years, a Quincy Public Schools employee for a couple of times, and for 16 years I served on the Quincy School Committee. I cannot tell you how painful it is for me that these meetings have been held in the Quincy Public Schools, and I'll tell you why. Every day, Children come to the Quincy Public Schools for the first time. Perhaps you all have come and enrolled your children here. It doesn't matter when you walk in the door with a child what race you are. It doesn't matter if you are young or old. You can be a teenage mom or somebody my age raising your grandchild. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, gay or straight. Doesn't matter if you speak English doesn't matter if you have a third grade education or a PhD, 
it doesn't matter what your religion is, and it doesn't matter what your politics are. In fact, you could show up in the Quincy Public Schools with your neo-Nazi uniform on, spout your xenophobia and your hatred to the office staff, and what do you think would happen when you left? What would happen to your child? I'll tell you exactly what happens. Every child, that child, your child, would be treated by the Quincy Public Schools as God's gift to this school system. Because, because that is what every single child in this school system is. But when they come to the Quincy Public Schools, they are not treated to hate. They are not, they are not taught to hate. They are taught to get along with each other. Little kids are taught to share and take turns and pay attention. Older kids, by the time you have graduated from the Quincy Public Schools, you have gone to school with everybody. We're not perfect, but our values are modeled every day in the Quincy Public Schools. And those are values of welcoming the newcomer, of tolerating differences, of realizing that everybody, no matter where they come from, no matter what their disability might be, deserves a shot in the Quincy Public Schools, in our community, and in the United States. So long after all the people who came here with hate in their hearts, with malice, leave this room, the hate will go with you. The Please, folks, folks. There are, there are, I, and let, let, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, there are there people in this room who, I am not accusing you or anybody else. I'm saying that if there, whatever hate there is in this room. Linda, if we, uh, you made some good points. Do you have any question? Uh, I don't, Mayor. Thank okay. you. Okay. You go to the other side. Uh, my name is Seth Plum. I live across the street from Eastern Nazarene College. Uh, I was a little worried when I moved in across the street from a college. I figured there'd be a bunch of drunken kids like messing up my yard. Guess what? It's a Christian college. And ENC has been an amazing neighbor to me for almost 20 years. They actually try to live the life of Christ. They don't just call themselves Christians. I'm not a Christian myself, but I admire that. Reverend Steve's my neighbor. <sighs> what you guys maybe are forgetting is the Constitution of the United States protects every single one of us in the country and our territories. Now, before you condemn me as some creepy liberal. I was a Border Patrol agent for three years. I spent 25 years as an immigration officer. I know, I see people, I saw people coming across the border every day. God, kids, women, you see women's underwear all along these trails. It's bullshit what these people have to put up with to get here. Now, I was a little, a little worried about this immigrant shelter moving in across from me, but I thought, wow, Let's just wait and see. I gotta tell you, the baseball team over there, ENC, does more to disrupt the neighborhood than these families walking down the sidewalk. But what tore it for me was Nazis coming into my neighborhood. You know who paid for it? Hey, if you're a neighbor of ENC, maybe you'll know that they've been selling off properties left and right. You want that property to go down? What's that? All right. Uh, can we, um, uh, if you have a question, a comment, to wrap up. So uh, a lot uh, of people are waiting to speak, so I if am, we can get to the point. I'm really concerned about what's going to do with security over there. My, I used to, I walked my child through ENC campus every day to Beachwood Knoll. And now that she's a teenager and she's wandering the streets alone to see her friends in the neighborhood, I'm a little concerned about the element that just the, the mere presence of this thing is bringing in with, well, 
frankly, this, this national socialist club, they are, they're, they're, they are terrorists. Yeah, well, look at the Amnesty International website. They're literally terrorists, bro. All right, I mean, so uh, what I do want to know is will the state, in the event that Quincy can't protect us, bring in the state police when there are people like that? And I know Quincy PD is an awesome police department. I've worked with several of the officers. I can over assure the of my you career. that the Quincy Police Department will keep you safe and keep this community safe. Uh -huh. We will not need assistance. We have a very well-funded, very well-equipped department, well, and it was handled the other night in a very professional way. And, and along those lines, though, I know that a lot of people are up in arms about the fact, where is this money coming from? You so have a question? We've got, we got other no, people that want to go. Yes, question. everybody else. I, all right. Going to go to this side? So actually, it's... I, guess a good thing I'm coming right after him because my question is directly for you. Mm -hmm. um, several folks tonight have spoken to the events that took place this weekend and while I have no doubt that our police officers in this town are wonderful at what they do, great at their ability to protect our town, um, one comment and then I will get to my question, I do think that it's a little bit um, naive to say that we will never need help from the state police. Um, there comes a time when you cannot rely on yourself and with the events that took place this weekend, if they continue, quite frankly, it will lead to a situation where somebody is getting hurt and because of the violence that that sort of language incites. And we all certainly do have a constitutional right to freedom of speech. But our constitutional right to freedom of speech does not protect us when it comes to hate speech, when it comes to language that incites riots, when it comes to the sort of ideologies that those groups are spewing. So with them on our street corners, with them in our neighborhoods, and you say that it's going to take, you know, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember how it was that you mentioned it to the woman that stood in this space earlier tonight. Um, the, something along the lines of it would have to reach a certain point before, um, you know, our police officers step in to, to protect uh, rather than just standing there. And I want to know, um, considering these are neo-Nazi groups and you are the mayor of this city, shut up, I'm speaking. And you are the mayor of this city. I want to know why you allow that. When we all know, history has told us, my grandparents, fought the actual Nazis, and history has told us what Nazi ideology will do to our world, what it will do to our people, and you have a responsibility to all of us. And I want to know your answer, why they're allowed to spew that hatred. Because it is damaging and it is dangerous, and somebody will get hurt, and it'll be you that's to blame because you waited until it was the right time. Okay. okay. You, 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 oh, shut up, everybody. All right, you've, you've spoken. Let me respond. Uh, you alluded to your family. I'm a, a grandson of a German immigrant. My father and his three brothers and all my uncles on my mother's side fought in World War II. I had an uncle who was in the Battle of the Bulge who got a bronze star. So, I, you know, I don't want to make this a contest about patriotism here. I'm not. We're not. I'm you not you spoke. All. You spoke. Let me finish. We have an excellent police department, very well trained, very professional. They know the lines, and nobody liked what we saw the other night. I don't, I don't sponsor that. We, I don't like that like anybody else does or doesn't. The reality is we may not like it, but they have a constitutional right to speak. And, and listen, they, so, they, so it's, it's if you read speech. my comments in the Globe, I, I was absolutely, my comments were pretty clear. That's not the values of the I city. Did not see that. It's not the values of the city, and we will not put up with it. Having said that, the police department was all over it. They monitored it, and uh, if anyone got out of line, they would have been arrested. But my question is not I, I, answered. I didn't hear a question. My que okay, then you weren't listening properly. My question is, what's the line? My question is, what's the line? And I said as much when I said, what's it going to take 
for them to step in. What is the line? I want to know. My neighbors in this neighborhood want to know. What's the line? They demonstrated. We not, may not like what they have to say. They did no vandalism. They didn't assault anybody. I'll, I'll allude to a captain on the police department if they want to speak, but there are lines that weren't crossed. I'm not an expert on every police matter, but I can assure you with our department, had anyone crossed that line, that would have ended. So what is, what is the line, I though? just described a couple of those lines. So, you, so we have to wait for somebody to get assaulted? No, it's not a setup. All right, hold on, hold we on. We voted for him. I can ask these questions. I live in this town, and I am concerned for my safety. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, one of our esteemed captains to address your question, okay? I'm Captain Jim Flaherty, Quincy Police. When a uh, civil disorder is declared, it's five or more armed people and disorderly, or ten or more people unarmed and disorderly. Those folks followed the line uh, to the letter of the First Amendment, and uh, we had to you know, follow our line as well. But uh, we, once they crossed the line, we were prepared to you know, take action. But uh, they're, allowed to, they're allowed to do the protests on both sides. Fuck, it's the line! We're gonna go to the other side now. Hi, Sarah Belfort. I live in Marymount on C Street. And I'd like to I thank everybody who shared their stories as refugees or as um, children and grandchildren of refugees. I, am, I really came up here to repeat the question that the lady asked you, Mayor Koch, after she told her story of crossing the Pacific Ocean. She asked, what is the city of Quincy doing? Meaning to be welcoming to people, to, to welcome immigrants, to welcome migrants, to support them. I've heard a lot about, oh, you know, I've heard a lot about what these other organizations are doing and state agencies. Where, where is the city? What is the city doing or what is the city planning to do? And given the exchange that just happened, I have to say that sounded too much to me like a good people on both sides kind of comment. Okay. Mayor Koch, you have a responsibility as the leader of this city, not just to say, oh, we're not this, we're not that. What does, city, what does the city of Quincy stand for? You know, are, are you willing to get up there and say and make it part of your campaign that, yes, we're a city of immigrants. We are welcoming people. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing to combat hate. This, that's not the first, you know, that's not the first kind of racist uh, episode or attack that's happened in this city. So I would like to, you know, I would like you to answer the other lady's question about what, we're, what the city is doing. Well, a, a little background for us since you, you went on a little bit. If uh, you may know that as mayor, I'm also chairman of the school committee. And if you look at all the things we've been doing in our school system, and I know Mrs. Stice alluded to a little bit of that, and we have a number of colleagues here. Uh, we have an excellent school system that treats everybody with dignity and respect. And the goal is for every child for the opportunity to succeed. It doesn't matter what their color, their race, or their religion. The fact is the city of Quincy has been a city of immigrants for a long time. If you go back 100 years, 30% of our population would have been immig immigrants. Today, 30% of our population is immigrants. We support Quincy Asian Resources. We support Bay State Community Services in what they do with grants to assist the programs. And we are prepared to deal with whatever issues may come up that the city as a municipality will deal with. We've certainly been there with our medical services. Our fire departments responded a number of times to medical incidents. Uh, and we continue to communicate and monitor things. And whatever we need to do, we will do. We're going behind you. You've spoken twice. We're going to go to the woman no, behind. No, no. There's too many people waiting. We'll go back to the other side. Oh, my name is Mimi Balsamo, and I live at 27 Post Island Road. I grew up pretty much right near where I live right now, and um, 
I'm a co-founder uh, of Stand Out Quincy for Black Lives. And um, woo! Woo! My, I'd like to continue to ask my question to you, to Mayor Koch. Uh, I know that um, you said, as, as the head of the school committee, how great the public schools are to all, with all um, nationalities and the things that you have supported. But I would say I was so disappointed when you sent around the letter um, to announce the meeting and you seemed to just make every effort to kind of disavow any responsibility for the fact that um, we have this welcome center and that housed at ENC. And I really think that it was an opportunity for you to show leadership, moral courage, and moral leadership. And I'd like to know how you can help make things, I think if you could give that guidance, you'd bring a more peaceful environment because you leave everything up in the air. No one knows exactly where things stand. The Secretary Walsh would like to say something. I appreciate, oh, hi. I've been listening to the, these questions and, you know, I'm not, and the, I, I think that, you know, the communication on this has not been perfect. I think Eastern Nazarene has owned some of that, but I think, that your mayor has shown more moral courage and commitment to this cause by having this meeting. There are 80 cities and towns. I don't wanna do this 80 times, but I, I, I really have a, a lot of respect for, for Mayor Koch for making the space available, for letting people's opinions be heard, by calling us on the carpet so we can answer your questions. And you know, again, I don't want to. Don't tell your friends. I don't want to do this 80 times across the Commonwealth. But I, I really think that actions speak louder than words. And and his actions here tonight, I think, really do reflect his values and commitment to this cause. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. We couldn't be. Eastern Nazarene couldn't do what they do. Bay State couldn't do what they do if the mayor wasn't with us. <laughs> Thank you for e explaining that, and I think if the mayor expressed that to all of us, it would be would have been more clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, I got a question uh, on the uh, children. Are their children will go to our school? If they go to our school, run our fund, who pay for the teacher, and uh, will we increase our property property tax? Are we the nonprofit? Is it our government is nonprofit business for all these migrants? I, I think I got the question. We have no kids enrolled in our system from this migrant community. And as I understand it, for those cities and towns across the state, uh, if they do, they get reimbursed for the cost of the education of those kids. But we already have a limited, we already were overcloud in the class. They don't go to school. We'll go this side. Hi, my name is um, Andrew Fitzpatrick. I'm a student at Eastern Nazarene College, so I can speak to Woo! I can speak to the perspective of a student. Um, I served as an assistant resident director at ENC, so I can say that when we first found out um, that our school is going to be how, um, doing this program, there was concern amongst the students as well. Um, the communication wasn't perfect, as Dr. McCoy is, has admitted, um, but those concerns were. What is this going to do to my, to my job load? Um, am I going to have more responsibilities because of this? As I've gotten back to campus, there, this has been perfect. There hasn't been, I haven't had any increased workload as an assistant resident director. Um, the refugees there, the families there haven't caused me any issues. They haven't caused any issues to the residents that I, that I um, supervise and help. Uh, it has been a, it's a great program and it has been a joy for me to see kids smiling as I walk across my campus. Um, I've been grateful for the opportunity we've had to help. Um, and so my, 
I just like to say that as students, um, this hasn't had any negative effect on our on our campus. The only effect it's had outside of Saturday night's events have been positive. Um, we've had increased security patrols on campus. There's more cameras on campus. Um, I've felt safer on my campus this semester than I have in my past two years at this school. Um, and I'd like to ask Dr. McCoy, I know we've talked, or there's been brief mentions of potential internships and partnerships with um, these programs. Could you speak at all to what those might be or anyone else who has information on that? So as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the things that was attractive to us about this was the opportunity to expand the horizons of our students' education. Uh, and thanks to Bay State and, and to AMI, uh, we've opened up, is it five, Doris? Five internships this semester that are exclusively for Eastern Nazarene College students uh, and opportunities for uh, volunteer engagement um, and future, uh, future endeavors as well. So uh, as you know, Andrew, we'll be talking more about that in chapel on Thursday to make sure that students have all the details on what they, what's available. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to go this side. You're up. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, I've been living in Quincy for 11 years. I've been like most of us, I am a legal immigrant in this, this country, and we waited in line for many years. And like uh, my family and I immigrated here, as soon as we arrived, we started working. We did not apply for any government benefit, not like these new immigrants. They are using the government's resources. I just want to tell my story first, then ask two questions, OK? It's going to be short, not too long, OK? Be, be patient. Thank you. 現在我也是美國公民了,我非常感謝美國和昆西,它是一個如此歡迎新移民的地方。Now I'm a US citizen and I want to thank this country in Quincy. This is a very welcome place. 但同時,我也我也知道,無規矩不成方圓,美國應該是一個法治國家,昆西應該是一個有規則的地方。at the same time, I know we need rules, we need laws, we, re like, uh, we need regulations, including Quincy. In our country, Confucius um, First of all, I would like to say Confucius said, we treat people the way we want to be treated. So first of all, I would like to ask the gentleman with the red tie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 我想问一下, officer, where are, where are you living right now? Do you live in Quincy? No. OK. Where are you living right now? I'm from, I'm from Worcester that has hundreds of families uh, who are living there. OK. So, so is there a shelter in your community right now? Several. Several. Huh? Several. Several? Yes. Is it before this shelter or after this shelter? Do you have a question related to the, uh, the to the situation in front of us? Um, so, okay, uh, I, speak, I speak broken English. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I just want to, you know, know if the, the Democrat officer, they support shelter, support the refuse, okay, they can bring them to their community first, not Quincy first. Quincy, we, we don't know anything about, about the shelter. That's why we're angry. That's why we are here, right? So, 
Mr. Mayor, could I? Mr. Secretary, go ahead. I, I think it's helpful just to understand this is a welcome center where folks come for three to five days while they're as assessed and then move to another more permanent location. So there are 6,400 families in Massachusetts right now, 58 families are in Quincy, and the balance of the 6,400 families are in 80 other communities around Massachusetts, multiple locations in other cities and towns in Massachusetts. So there are many communities that are doing their part to meet the needs of homeless families, children, infants, pregnant moms. And I want to make sure folks are clear, too, when we talk about illegal, the folks who are here have legal ability to be here. They have the legal ability to be here. They are fleeing war and other circumstances, just like the folks who had to leave Ukraine after the invasion had to come or Afghanistan, or any other circumstance where folks had to flee violence. So they are here with legal authority, but they can't work yet. That's a process that takes a number of months, which the governor has been working hard to try to get the federal government to expedite. I, I understand what you're talking about. You're talking too much. But what we think, Please, what uh, we think is that this is crazy. This is America. We have a law. Everybody need to... Up. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. You've made your point, and I think that point's been addressed. So we're going to go to the other side now. Ma'am? Am, am I good? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Danessa DeAndrea. I go to ENC. Ooh. I am a senior there right now. Um, a lot of the people from ENC are in the audience. Uh, I'm just here to advocate for the students that agree with having the refugees on campus. Um, sorry, I'm like really nervous, <laughs> but on Saturday, the events, I want to thank the Quincy Police Department for getting there so quickly. Um, it really made us feel safe, like, I've never felt not safe in Quincy besides this event. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Do you have one? No, it's okay. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so basically I'm a part of the BSU, which is a, um, the Black Student Union on campus, and um, the lady who was speaking about doing the teddy bear drive, and that we would love to get a part of that, um, and just really advocate again for the refugees that are on campus. We really love that, and um, yeah, we've had to adapt to COVID. We've had to adapt to so much being um, a student there, and um, we've never seen this as an issue. It's never, as Andrew said, um, I've gone to school with him for multiple years, and I just really like appreciate that they came. Like They haven't affected our lives. You can ask multiple other students there. None of our lives have been impacted by them, so we Thank just kind of find it like um, really unheartening that the city of Quincy has such hatred or dislike for them being there. I'm sorry if that makes some of you guys feel some type of way, but we at the students who actively are engaged in the community and do so much outreach love having them here and we have never seen them as an issue. Um, okay, and I do have a question for Bill. I mean, this could probably be an email, but if I have a platform to speak, I'm gonna speak. Um, but um, what, <laughs> I know. Um, so what additional measures of safety, I know we've addressed it in emails and like multiple different things, but I was there on Saturday firsthand. I got pretty close. I have a, I have a video, I was there. Um, so what additional measures of safety can you implement or can we start to implement that can make your students definitely feel safer sure. um, all overall around campus? Thanks, Nessa. So I, I, before I speak directly to, to Nessa's question, I, I do want to add uh, my thanks uh, to the Quincy Police Department for their incredibly efficient response. And, and I will just add uh, that the particular group that was responsible for Saturday night's atrocious event uh, has a well-known pattern of doing these kinds of demonstrations that are intentionally brief and that push right up to the edge of what is legal, as the officer explained, but that adhere to the law but manage to inflict maximum psychological terror on their targets. They also have a clear pattern of coming once and not returning. Um, and so that's not a guarantee, of course, but it is a reason to be 
cautiously optimistic that Saturday night's events are not likely to recur. That being said, uh, we are continuing to work uh, with the Quincy Police Department. Um, our campus security has been uh, increased uh, as, a, as a measure for the time being uh, and are continuing to actively sort of monitor the situation to figure out what needs to be done because the safety of our students and the safety of our community is absolutely essential to us. Hi, my name is Laura. I live in, um, on Silver Street in Quincy Point. I'm also a leader of Unite Here Local 26, a hotel, casino, and food service workers union. Our union is full of immigrants. Uh, almost everyone who's a member is an immigrant. We have members in the room tonight who have a variety of opinions. I can tell you from personal experience, it will all be fine. We'll figure out how to get along. I want to thank you all for your support, and I want to see if there's anything else we can do in Quincy to be welcoming to immigrants, because that's who we should be. Good evening. Ooh. Uh, my name is Kat Hampson, and I uh, live on Billings Street in North Quincy. I am a pastor by vocation and a local resident for 11 years. Uh, before I say my question, I would like to invite everyone to take a deep breath please. There's a lot of tension in the room. Um, so I, I, I realize that not everyone here is a person of faith. That's, I, I, I get that. Uh, but I suspect that faith or spirituality may have played an important part on the lives of a lot of folks in this room. Um, so first, if you identify folks as a person of faith, I invite us to listen to one another. Uh, now, I, my question is uh, directed towards the ENC representative. I realize that trust has been broken, but I'm con confident that you can rebuild this with your neighbors in time. Um, and I'm appreciative of the student voices that have uh, spoken here. Uh, I would love to draw attention to ENC's mission statement. If you could put that up on the slide, please. I realize we've been on this slide for a while. Um, and invite the representative from ENC to articulate, uh, how do you see what you are doing aligning with your mission statement? and with the Christian values that you hold. I also invite anyone on this panel, if you do identify as a person of faith, feel free to talk, um, but this is for ENC as they are a private Christian college. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to try to do that and be brief. I think our, our time is, uh, is short, so maybe a longer conversation is gonna be necessary. The, the in-house language that we use to describe this project uh, is to refer to it as the Matthew 25 initiative, which was the, the passage that one of the speakers uh, read earlier, and is the passage where Jesus, uh, sort of at the end of, uh, of all things, is talking about what it meant to be faithful to, uh, to him, right, and to have, uh, to have met his needs, and he identifies that with the least of these. And so the Church of the Nazarene has for a long time, as I mentioned earlier, adopted a, a position and been involved in various kinds of ministries that are meant to do that. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries is a, is a, uh, a separate nonprofit entity that does work all around the world uh, in, in trying to address human need and suffering uh, wherever it's found. Uh, so I think that as much as we want our students, as it says there, to be agents of Christ's love, and truth, I think that that's what we mean by that. That's what it takes uh, to be a representative to understand the call of Christ in our lives. Yeah. My name is Kathleen Peterson. I was moved here, promoted for a job in 2011, and I've been here since. It's disappointing to me to see the number of people in this room instead of asking questions, are using it to rant their points of view and anger. I just have one question. Is there any structure within anything anywhere that can have people volunteer? COVID had me retire, and I'm an intelligent, vibrant senior. Can I help? There we go. 
Um, thank you. There is definitely opportunities to volunteer. If you go on the Bay State Community Services website, there's actually a volunteer section. We'd love to have you. Hello. Um, my name is Janice Miller. I live on Rawson Road. Um, I know some of you. I'm wondering, it seems that there are the same fears that are brought up again and again that we're not taking care of our own people in this community, um, a worry that we're helping people who didn't come here through the process and jump the line, um, worries about there not being enough for everyone. Um, and so I know that you've said it before, but Everyone who is housed in this temporary processing center, it's a way station. They come in, their needs are assessed, um, they get any medical help, and then they move on. So they're not going to necessarily settle in our community, go to our schools. Um, it's not expected that our schools will have to take in lots of students. Um, we provide the fire and the police like we would if there were students there, no different. Um, what do you think is the best way you can explain that these are people who are here, who by our government's laws currently are allowed, who didn't jump the line, um, and that we're, uh, Mayor Koch, that, you know, they're not expected to really enroll in our schools. And so we're, how can you all address that fear that they're taking something that they're not entitled to? Because I think that's behind a lot of what's going on. trying to convey here tonight um, with some, you know, a varying degrees of success, obviously. You know, I think that that's why we started with slides so we, we could set the stage. Quincy is not singled out. Um, it is not disproportionately impacted by any means. Um, there are many cities with many, many, many more people. Um, you know, I, I, I really, it sounds like you listened and absorbed our messages, so I appreciate that, so thank you. If, if I can add, because it, the, the question has come up a few times about, you know, why isn't this particular shelter at Eastern Nazarene College housing, uh, you know, homeless veterans or, or things of that nature? And I, I wanna say that you know, first of all, um, ENC, its students, its alumni uh, have and will continue to have a long engagement with organizations like Father Bill's, uh, which we love and have been supporting as actively as we possibly could uh, for many, many years now. This is not about trying to take from one pool and, you know, address it to, to a different pool. I was having a conversation with Senator Keenan the other day who was making the point that there are enormous sums of money that are being spent to try to support veterans and homeless individuals. And it's not getting everyone's needs met. We all know that. We all regret it, right? And want to see those things improved. But this isn't depleting. This isn't t causing the state to take money out of those pools. Uh, and the, I mean, the, the reason, uh, it's important also to note that the, sh the temporary shelter that is operating at Eastern Nazarene College, it is, not a, it is not a specific criteria to be eligible for the shelter program there that you be a migrant. That is not a requirement. We set parameters around the kinds of populations that we were confident could be housed safely on our campus. And that meant families, pregnant mothers, people with small children, 
that we felt would be compatible with our needs and with our community's needs. Those criteria do align at this moment in time with a specific set of migrant families, and that is primarily who is, ha is housed there, and we are happy to welcome them as human beings, but we're not trying to make some kind of grand political statement um, or, or advocate just for one cause at the expense of all others. There are many important causes that exist in this community. Hello, my name is Joan Maselli, and I live on Fenno Street. And I want to thank Mayor Koch for allowing us to be here and ask our questions, and for the panel. And Bill, we've had a few phone conversations. Um, I was very upset with the lack of transparency with ANC. Um, I guess my main concern is, I don't want Quincy to come off that we, we hate immigrants, or we don't want um, anybody here, we just want to make sure that they're here, they're vetted, that they are here legally. Um, we all see what's happening in the state of New York, and there's 200,000 migrants there, whether they're um, there as illegals or they have the asylum or what, they're living on the streets. I don't want Massachusetts to become that. I don't think any of us do. I didn't think we were a sanctuary city, but I know this bill went into place in 1983 when Mayor Dukakis put it into place. I also know that we could probably vote, and it's being used in order to get federal funding, I think, by our governor, which she should, because our president is, al is allowing the border to be open. Um, no, and I'm not, and again, I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm being, you know, I sound like I'm being, um, I don't want the Ill immigrants to come in here, and, and that's not what I'm saying. I just want it to be done in, 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 a, in a way that their rights are met as well. So if they come over here, they're not living in a tent. They're not being transported by, you know, flown by Republicans to Democratic states. And why should Texas take the whole, the whole border um, situation themselves, but that there's a plan in place for them. That they're not sitting in streets in New York City for 200 days with, with no food and, and, we're, and, and, and how are we supposed to have people come visit Massachusetts or any of the states that are taking in the, the, the immigrants when you want people to come and, and visit those states? So, I don't you have, know. you have a question or? I don't know what my question. I guess my okay. question. My, I guess my question is, with with ENC, with ENC being like a, I'm going to say like a, a, a test pilot of 58 families, are we going to have more pop-ups in the city? Um, I I guess I can speak a little bit to that. Um, we just have gone through a major new program at Father Bills, um, and we've added. It's a whole new concept there, which we participate in which has a triage area, which has interim housing, and a lot more services for folks. So we, we continue to do the things we knew, need to do to meet with the, the commitment and the challenges out there. And I know Father Bills unfairly gets blamed every time there's a homeless person on the streets, it's, it's Father Bills. There's for some folks that don't want to seek help, for whatever reason, have certain challenges. So we, we, we monitor that situation on a, on a regular basis, just, just like we I, quite frankly, I think Washington has let us down on the immigration issue. Um, it's, and, and I say that, and let me, let me clarify that. And, and um, you know, you, you, you can't have just open borders without a process. And, and, I, and I think those that are seeking asylum and other issues, there are, there are ways. And I also think those that make it here, it shouldn't take them eight or ten years to get a citizenship. Uh, so this nation was built on immigrants and the values and contribution of immigrants. But uh, I, you know, I, I would think the great minds we have in this country could do a better job in Washington to figure that out. Um, but I can assure you that there won't be pop-up tents, uh, pop-up um, things that you see in New York and, and other places in the country. And, and I know that creates some of the fear and uncertainty with this. Uh, I can assure you that's not going to happen in Quincy, Massachusetts. 
tents at Wallison train station, which was a year ago over the summer. I know that was moved out. I know that there's supposedly tents around the can man. So I just want to make sure that, again, our citizens are being taken Understood. care of as Understood. well. Understood. Appreciate your point. Going to go this side. I want to start by saying shalom. If everybody can say shalom with me. Peace. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for having us. I want to start by thanking Mayor Cook. I have a TV show in Quincy. I'm Haitian. I've come to Quincy for years ago just with a handbag. Right now, thanks to those wonderful people of Quincy, many of you, from Ruthie, from Sally, from Kathy, from uh, so many of you, Juanita, thanks to you today, 12 years after the earthquake, we have a wonderful school in Haiti that up to June 25th was welcoming 500 kids. And it's thanks to all the people of Quincy that are here. I want to thank Mayor Cook too for coming uh, unexpectedly the other day in the street of Quincy on the show and to assure us that uh, Quincy, in a simple sentence, is a Quincy welcoming for the immigrants. Thanks, Mayor Cook, and may God bless you for that. I have to say that uh, I want to also thank Eastern Nazarene for having my brothers and sisters there. May God bless you abundantly. God is in this story. We Haitians are not invaders. We Asian come from a, the most beautiful island country that I know of the face of the world. I travel to so many countries and I can say it humbly. I wonder if anybody knows what took us, what took my brothers and sisters Haitian to Quincy. Over 20 years ago, I was mainly one of the rare Haitians to come to the city of Quincy. I came to Quincy with just a handbag. We missed the bus, my mom and I. <laughs> I came for studying. I wanted to learn English at Harvard. And then we were living at a friend of my grandmother uh, in Wendorf, and we took the wrong bus, 240. We ended up in Quincy Center. We said, gee, what a beautiful city. <laughs> and sure enough, my mom left me with almost nobody here, and I returned to the city one day. As I was walking on Bill Street, there was a gentleman who was a realtor. I stopped right in front of his office, and there was an older man, and I said, where is a place to stay? And then he said, I'm going to introduce you to someone. He took me to a fellow gentleman who was very kind. Not only I rented that person's place, I ended up buying that place, which worth almost a million dollars right now. <laughs> Over the years, we had the earthquake in Haiti. I wonder if the people that are here today know who we are and what took us here. There is no Haitian that would never, ever want to leave Haiti and not step foot there. 12 years ago, we had an earthquake that shook the world. I'm sure many of you here donated money for Haiti to be restored. Yet, we haven't seen one sense of it to the point that I myself wrote and called many people in charge whose name you know, who I'm not going to say, and told them, what did you do with our money? This is when I was told, Marie Denise, do your own NGO, okay? So therefore, with the help of some simple parents, 
where my daughter went to school, like Juanita, Juanita, thank you. And uh, there's some friends from Quincy Ruti, thank you, who told me about this event. We were able to start the Senti School Foundation. Over the years, we never received one cent of any big organization that received money for Haiti. It is thanks to going door to door for in several businesses and to sample citizens of Quincy, like Larry uh, just went, yeah, Mr. Shea and many people here, they rally before us. Mr. The son, the Mr. Bob Rosebud, publicized our event, and therefore we had funds that allows us for the past 12 years not only to rebuild a simple Minga school of 12 simple rooms, but today we welcome 500 children. Yet, can you get, to, uh, with the hours getting late, can you get to the uh, question if you have one? My question is, do the people, when I heard that there were newcomers here from Ruti and uh, some friends, and that was creating tension, I said, Ruti, I have to find a way, and from Carol at Queen's TV where I have the show, I have to find a way to help. Therefore, I went to the center. They told me it was uh, that organization, I don't know the name, that I had to go to several parts to get help. And I said, I would like to even bring clothes. And do people know who are those people? And I spoke to some of the newcomers here. They let me know that many of them had their house burned. I wonder if people know how these people came. They had their house burned. Some of them have been whipped. Some of them have their neck cut. They fled with almost a shirt on them, and they went to Latin America. These people, I heard the big word, terrorists. We are not terrorists. We are world changers. We are history makers. We are people who are coming here to add to the fabric of America. I have a show in Quincy. Why I say God is in the picture? Because, like the lady said, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. We come to Quincy to change the fabric of America and add to it. You will heal from us. We are not here, we are the one who wipe the people in the nursing home. We are the doctors in the big hospital. We are the people who carry your things to you. We are the people who do your hospital beds. You will see the people, I guarantee you. We come to Quincy not to invade. We come because we are fleeing now. I didn't have to flee. My parents didn't want me to come. Yet, I want people to know you know, whatever you can do for those people, do it. Do it. Thank you. Thank you. Do it. I'm going to go back to this side. Shalom, everybody. Thank and you. And please let me know because they, they didn't want me to bring clothes. They wanted them to be new. I'm willing to help. After that, please let me. Hi. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. I think it's important that we have these conversations so that we can all hear each other out and come to a solution. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the people of the board. I remember a few questions ago, um, somebody had mentioned that um, the immigrants are coming here with temporary protected status, which is the same status that Ukrainians got um, post Russian invasion. So I think it's important that people know these things so that they can better understand the conditions of the people that are coming here. They're looking for work. They're looking for to put their kids in school. They're not here to invade and um, roam the streets and take over Quincy. So that notion, I think, is, um, I think it's encouraged by a lot of misinformation and so I have a question for the mayor. We've talked a lot about how the communications, the line of communications have been faulty. 
how do you plan on informing the people of Quincy who these people are and um, fixing the lines of communication so that a little bit of this rage that I'm seeing um, subdues? Well, I think tonight was a major step in that. I think the information that was shared tonight, the questions that were addressed and answered by our panel, uh, to know exactly what's going on. I think there was a lot of misconception on, on people being there. We've learned that it's a welcome center, uh, that people aren't here long term. They moved around the Commonwealth. There are 80 communities dealing with some of these uh, challenges that the state is facing right now. Uh, and, uh, and the welcome center is doing their part to assist. So if there's any changes from that, we'll certainly uh, put together a meeting or a mailing to the neighborhood and let people know what's going on. But uh, there's also, as uh, ENC put up there, they got a website. If there's any questions or concerns, you can also go to the website. Uh, we are in constant contact now with Bay State Community Services, with Dr. Cox and, and the folks assisting uh, for the city to uh, continue to work with them. So uh, we'll get a wrap up soon. So if you got a question. I, I do. Um, okay. I meant like, how are you keeping these lines of communications available between you and the um, residents of Quincy. Like, how is it consistently coming from um, the town of Quincy, what's happening with these immigrants, who they are, that they are legal? Like, there's a lot of misinformation, and I think a lot of this can be resolved with people knowing what they're talking about. I think that's what tonight was all about. So do you, so how going, do you? So going forward, do you have an understanding what that facility is? Uh, and who, who is going there and uh, how it operates and the services they are getting. Um, and certainly we'll continue to monitor it, work with the, the folks running it. If things should change, we will certainly alert the community. Okay. Um, We're gonna I stay on this side because you, you guys have already spoken. We're gonna okay. stay here. We're gonna wrap up with this line. Go ahead. Um, you, no, so we, we gotta wrap it up. Sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so I have a similar question. I actually work at a health center in a as a case manager, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my newer clients are recent Haitian immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something that's been brought up, not only like the legality of them being in the United States has been brought up, which I think is like both on you as a mayor and then also as on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, sending out, whether it be emails, letters, me creating websites to, to to, to shut down this misinformation, but also I have heard this kind of like resonating thought that these people are not trying to work and these people are not trying to better society. And I also was wondering, okay, so what are we gonna do about spreading that information? Like I have one of my clients, he ended up coming to the US from, he, w he went from Haiti to the DR and then came to the US. He came at the end of, of, of June. He got his work permit at, by the beginning of August, and now he's working 8.30 to 5 every day. You know, like, these people are not malicious people. They are working hard. Um, so that was one of my questions, like, how are we going to shut down this misinformation about, one, their legality, and then, two, like, how they're trying to benefit society. And then my second question is, I know as of now, it, this the at, at ENC, it's just, like, um, temporary like shelter but at a certain point it's like we are getting a rush of immigrants and immigrants don't just stay in one place like they will go to other places how is Quincy going to ensure that when particularly for the students like the kids how is Quincy going to ensure if they get Haitian little kids that come to their public schools how are they going to ensure their safety because I've heard a lot of hatred mm -hmm. and hatred does not stay with one person it goes to their kids so how are they going to ensure their safety and then how are they going to ensure that they're going to fair and just education because at the end of the day like I think something that we should pride ourselves as Americans is that we we do provide education for all and and especially Massachusetts citizens like we are the birthplace of public ed education mm -hmm. so how are we going to continue to keep these doors open for public education for everybody regardless of if they're born in the U.S. or born elsewhere. I appreciate that. Uh, I, you heard a little bit earlier, our, our schools are very welcoming. Mm -hmm. Education, uh, every kid is provided the opportunity. In fact, every family supported uh, based on the needs of each of those kids. We've got people from all over the world in our public school systems, and uh, I think we do an excellent job, our teachers, our staff, uh, in the system. So I, I you don't know if you're new to Quincy, but our school system is very diverse, very welcoming, and I think does a great job. I mean, but I guess my point on that, I, I understand that Quincy's welcome, and I'm not trying to take up too many space, too much space, but I guess 
the question from that is like, okay, as of now, Quincy has been welcoming, but I also think that as of now, Quincy has not had this same issue. What are you guys gonna do to ensure that when these students do eventually come, they continue to feel welcomed by Quincy? I also think that that ties into my question about spreading factual information about who these people are so that the children now know um, who their peers are, who their classmates are. Thank you. We're going to continue to do what we do, so we'll, we'll uh, stay tuned. It's not the same situation. Who's up next? Thank you. You're up. Hi. Um, I live in Quincy, so dry. I'm a resident of Quincy. I understand United States always have um, the refugee helping refugees been years, and that makes how United States great. I love United States. I live here, and then I never thinking like I will live here. Uh, I will go anywhere. But my worry is, I believe it's a lot of Quincy residents worry that because we see in New York, we see in another state, they're having big trouble with a lot of problems. So Quincy, I know it's not very wealthy town. It's not a wealthy city. So I don't know, Massachusetts, how many people try to plant it in Quincy? And what about Do Dover, uh, Wellesley, Newton, and all the rich town? I believe they have a lot of money on supplies and for helping all the refugees. Because I think in Quincy have so many people still need help. The problem is people come and go and the timeline and the people, the, what they need. It's going to be winter soon. And then some people still on the beach in be, um, what's the Wollaston Beach, sometimes still have the homeless hiding in the bush and sleeping there. And we are worried and we are scared because we have children in this city. And then we try to have, we have business here. We try to build up this, this city, and then we don't want any bad things to happen. I didn't mean to refugee can make things bad, but a lot of times people need help, but we, I don't know Quincy has a lot of money to help all the people for long term, and where's the money come from? Because my family work very hard, and we pay tax, and my husband work five o'clock in the morning and until seven o'clock at night and we have one children. We try to put a lot of money for our education for my children because I understand the children are the future of the United States. But I don't have extra money to have purse. I don't have extra money to buy any fancy stuff. All my money is go to my children. I donate, I don't have money. I still donate to our school for hundreds of dollars every year and school supplies, and then always help, help the school. I just want to know, it is a Quincy can handle that kind of money, or United States can handle this kind of money. The tax player, we love to help, because that's always have been helping refugees. But now, it's a huge number in this country. It's like, I understand, I have friends from Haiti. She told me that, since the program start, it's 7,000 every month come from Haiti, come here. I don't know another country how many come from, but since this year, January, they started 21,000 people. That's a lot of help. So let me know how many people go to stay in, in Quincy and how much we can help. I love to help too, you know? Like the lady was saying that they need diapers, they need things. But how many people we have to help? Do, do I have the power to help, you know? Did the countries have the power to help? Did the city have the country to help? But we don't want to think, thinking like we cannot help and then ask that turning to New York. And because we love here, that's why we care. Doesn't mean like nothing go with races because refugees come from this whole world. I am Chinese in the past. They come from China, they come from Mexico, they come from everywhere. There's no racism to talking about. There's no hate. 
but we're talking about the fact. Can we help? How much we can help? Why the rich town? Did they have it? Did they have shelter? Did they have the private school? They only have 10 people in their class. Our school have six of how many? 60 people in one grade. How many the teachers can help? You understand what I'm talking about? Yes. All I care, it's about our city. I love Massachusetts. That's a beautiful place. Everybody will come to come. But how much we can help? That's the problem. That I want, want to know. Why the rich town don't have the shelters? Can you? Can you help us? How much money we can pay for it? We need to mount the money. How much we can help? For how okay. long? Okay. Each month. That's the, I tell my son, you go to school, you learn good, you learn math. Everything is math, even the politics. How much people we can help, how much money for a pair of people, a family. I understand everybody try to have a good life. It is American dreams. Mm -hmm. So as I am, I have, I tell the guy, he's working a V station. I talk to him each time I go to fill my gas. I say, you are young, you should go to school, you should go get education. What do you want your life to be? You good education, you can get good job. But now, a lot of people come to this country. We need education for their children, even adults, even me. When I come to this country the first time, I'm not even going to go to Starbucks to buy a coffee because I don't know English. But what about the, those people? They don't speak English, they have to learn, they need a lot of support for language, for technique, for skill, for, for any uh, uh, professional. I go through this a lot. I go to city hall, stand up right there, ask the people who walk the dog. I say, will you read this sentence for me? They teach Quincy the people teaching me English because I try, I try very hard and I really love here. If people are trying hard in this country, I think there's no problem. But I don't know. I don't know everybody go to try or not. Okay, let's, uh, I, I know that um, the state has committed to uh, fund a number of these, I, I, I don't know about what communities are affluent or others, but I think you use the number of 80 communities are involved in this. Maybe Secretary, you could tackle that. 80 communities across Massachusetts, more are opening every day. Folks are in Concord, folks are in Newton, folks are in Boston, folks are in many, many communities all across Massachusetts. Uh, we don't place folks in communities based on their wealth. We place, place folks in communities based on where there's an availability to place them and then try to provide the supports that folks need. You will find as you meet these, these families, they are unbelievably resilient folks who've gone through unbelievable circumstances to navigate to get their families to a safe place. And many of these folks back home have professions, have skills, have been very accomplished. There's just violence and chaos in their home that are driving them here. It's not like they're coming here and have no skills or no work ethic, just the opposite. And I think as they get the opportunity to be able to work, we're gonna find folks are doing exactly what you did. They're contributing to our communities, they're building their families, they're building wealth, they're adding to the fabric of our communities, and they're making us a better country. Next up, thank you. Thank you. Bill Zamzow, 356 Washington Street. Um, Mayor Koch, I hate to tell you, but your recent prepared statement about last weekend's protest by NCS 131 was sorely lacking. Granted, its march was staged to score attention. Fortunately, nothing happened, and Quincy police responded effectively. At the same time, you otherwise appear to be sorely mistaken about NCS 131. The Anti-Defamation League views it to be a neo-Nazi group founded in Massachusetts with ties to Boston, Worcester, Rutland, Sturbridge, and yes, Quincy. And if you don't believe me, or the ADL, have Police Chief K K Kennedy reach out to the Department of Homeland Security 
or all of the manner of lo Massachusetts law enforcement jurisdictions where NCS 131 founder Christopher R. Hood Jr. is facing trial. In short, NCS 131 can be prosecuted. Also be reminded that NCS 131 did a rolling protest in Quincy 11 months ago, including taking a group selfie with masks on in front of the Quincy Police Department headquarters. In short, NCS 131 is more than just a bunch of clowns, as you noted, and you need to get serious about dealing with them. My question. <laughs> On my way in, didn't take my shoes off, but I counted about 40 police officers outside for assignment tonight. I spitball that as about a ten, fifteen thousand dollar expense. Who's paying for it? Who's paying for it? They were here tonight because we weren't sure if we were going to get some of those nitwits I showing don't up care. tonight. I'm asking who's paying for it? Not you. Taxpayers are. I'm a taxpayer, sir. Okay. Who's paying for it? It is this local taxpayers. Of course, local okay, taxpayers. Okay, fine. Thank you for answering. That's the role. That's we try to keep our people safe and their person and their property, and we will never scrimp on that. So we want to make sure tonight was safe for everybody attending. Step up, please. My question is for the college. So I grew up in a born again Christian family. I know the difference between right and wrong, but I also know the smoke and mirrors. Your college is in the spotlight, and solely because it sits in the middle of a neighborhood. It's surrounded by houses. You guys aren't in the middle of the woods with soccer fields and baseball fields with a large buffer, right? You're right in the middle of the neighborhood. So I just have a, uh, a question that's based on business, because I'm a businessman, just thinking logical to today's current means. Do you have an effective business plan in place to get your college back on track to where it's supposed to be so you're not relying on future taxpayer money to keep the lights on. Now, I have somebody within the family that writes grants, and that person's 75 years old now. He, he runs nonprofit organizations, and I see the work that he does. It takes true talent to know where to get that money from. Do you guys have the talent that you need to get your business back on track, and do you have a solid plan? Um, I mean, the, sh the short answer I'm going to give to that question is yes. Uh, I will tell you uh, that, uh, I mean, I'm going to spend the next two days locked in a conference room wrestling with those very questions, right? What are the next steps in our strategic plan? Uh, and I think our chief financial officer left, otherwise I'd hand him this question. But no, I mean, we understand that, you know, a one-year initiative, as exciting as it is, um, doesn't answer every question, right? And that colleges like us have no choice in this day and age, right? I mean, small colleges like us are dealing with incredibly challenging demographic realities and uh, financial realities across the Northeast especially uh, need, need to be invested deeply in creative endeavors and we're committed to that. Is the mic live? <clears throat> I just want to tell you that you guys are doing the right thing in the interim. So for long term for the college being that you're in the middle of the neighborhood It'd be good to see that the college gets back on track to an institution for, for college means. But thank you for answering my question. I really appreciate it and all you people here. And thank you, Mayor. Happy to talk more about it. Thank you. Uh, I want to again thank our distinguished panelists here tonight uh, for coming out and addressing the questions. I want to thank you all for attending and uh, safe home. God bless.